Prospecting in the desert is quite a bit different than prospecting in a wet area. Now granted, gold is still heavy, and so it still functions in many of the same ways, but there's a lot of different things to consider, and a lot of things that work in the wet area that just don't work in the dry, and vice versa. For one thing, if you're going to go into the desert, you need to have some basic concepts of desert safety and what the environment is like here. There's a lot of stuff out here that can get you. It's not really that dangerous, but it's more dangerous than being in a city or going to a state park someplace. So if you're going to go to the desert, you need to have plenty of water, things like that. You need to know that you have lots of cactus and sharp things that can poke you, and rattlesnakes and tarantulas the size of your hand, and man-eating jackrabbits, and lots of things that you need to be aware of before you come here. So that said, it's actually quite a bit of fun. It's a beautiful area, and it's a great place to spend the winter time because it's usually quite cool in the winter times. A lot of the world's gold is found in the desert, but unlike the moist areas where they have a lot of rivers and a lot of water to move the gold around, it's a lot easier to work gold over there. And so most people in the old days went out and worked there, and not nearly as many came to the desert because it just wasn't that easy to get here. It's a remote area. There weren't good roads. There's no water. So for a prospector to come out here with a mule, I mean, he had to be pretty hardy, and he just didn't have the resources or the ability to move that much dirt. In the 1920s and 30s, they brought in a lot of extra people, new machines, and they moved a lot of the dirt around. But still, the desert has not been walked anywhere near as much as, say, the gold-bearing areas in California or Alaska, because the water it makes it a lot easier to work gold on a large scale. So what that means for us is that there's still a lot of gold left here, probably proportionately more than there is left in the wet areas. So we need to learn how to process it efficiently, quickly, get the dirt processed, find the gold, and move on. And there's a lot of it here left to find. But as I said up front, gold works differently in the desert because you don't have the constant water running down the stream, constantly working the gold, moving it to the bedrock. A lot of the rules still apply, but they just work on kind of a slow motion scale. So where gold would get from point A to point B in a water river in a matter of a few months, it might take 20 or 30 years for the gold to move the same distance in a river that floods only once or twice a year, sometimes only once every five years. So that's where we are here. We have a lot of dry washes around here that get flash floods. A lot of water rushes through and moves dirt around for a day or two, and then nothing happens for another year, sometimes more than that. So learning how to find gold there is a little different because it's not always just a rule of thumb, gold is on the bottom, because gold still is on the bottom, but only of that layer that moved last year, because it didn't move all the dirt that's been there before. So whatever moves that year that has gold in it is going to be on the bottom of that layer. So that introduces a lot of complications that you wouldn't find in a, a wet river. So these dry creek beds have a lot of gold in them, and we're going to learn how to process them here in the next couple of videos. But for right now, we need to start with the basics. When you're walking in a wet area, it all comes down to panning. You use your pan for everything, from sampling to running out your concentrate, sometimes just a plain old prospecting. The same is kind of true in the desert, but on a different scale. Because in the desert, you don't have any water, and so the fundamental action of panning doesn't work the same because you don't have any water to make it into a liquid. If you drop a nug into a glass of water, it sinks to the bottom like that. You can watch it sometime. It's amazing how fast it goes down. Well, if you drop it on top of a pile of sand, nothing happens, because the sand just kind of holds it there. Even if that sand is wet, it still is just going to stay on top until you start shaking it. And that shaking action, in effect, liquefies the sand and makes it into a liquid that the gold can just drop through. Now, that works great when you have liquid. Well, when you're in a dry area, you don't have that liquid to work with. But you can still make it happen in basically the same way by shaking the sand around enough and agitating it so much the sand molecules are just running back and forth and vibrating enough so that the gold, which is a lot heavier and denser than they are, will just drop right through it. So that's what we're going to do. It's a lot more work than regular panning with water, but it can yield good results. It's lightweight and only takes one tool, maybe a scoop, and you can sample an area and see if there's gold there worth coming back for with a more efficient method later. So the first step, is to find the place you're going to dig your sample out of. Now, in this creek, which, like I said, floods once every couple of years probably, or maybe a little water trickles through now and again, you don't get a lot of gold movement here very often. So you look up there and you see water comes down to kind of flat, goes through some short rapids, curves around a little bit, comes down over some more rapids, flat spot, rapids, flat spot, and then it goes off into a big flat spot there. So these rapids are each going to act like a little bit of a sluice. So you come over these rocks, it's going to drop gold back here and suck it around and pull it back under those rocks. Just like in a regular river, just like I said, in slow motion, because it takes a lot longer for these things to happen. So your gold is not necessarily as deep as it would be if there was water flowing past here all day, every day. So we're going to dig down here under this rock, keeping an eye out for tarantulas and scorpions and snakes, because they also like to live under the rock, the same place the gold lives. Also keep an eye behind you for those killer jackrabbits. You laugh, but they're the size of kangaroos here. 
So, getting back under here. So, so we're already seeing this black sand here. And this is a very concentrated black sand. And that's a good sign because where well, black sand goes, gold might go. This does not mean that there is gold here, however. All it means is that the heavy stuff dropped out here. Because the black sand is the heaviest stuff in this creek next to gold. And so that means if there is gold here, this is a place it would probably have dropped. So it's a good place to look. So we're going to scrape this up and put it in here. Now, it's even more important when dry panning than it is with regular panning that you use a classifying screen. Because the differences in sizes make a big difference in how the whole process works. Sometimes it's not broken up very well, and the screen will help to break it up as you rub it through the screen, and make it into a finer dust that will work easier. So I'm going to scrape up everything here that I can find with the black sand, get myself about a half a pan full. You don't want to overfill your pan, which is true of a regular pan as well, again, even more so with dry panning. So we're going to have it about half full, and then we're going to start processing it up. Now you can see there's a lot of nice black sand right on this rock, and I'm going to probably pry that rock up and try to sweep the whole black sand off into here, because I don't think I can get it all up by hand. Just carefully pick it up and just drop it in there. And you can see how black that surface is. So if there's gold, it would be stuck down to that rock right like this. And this is a good place to have a wire brush, which is a tool you should have with you when you're out here in the desert to help you scrape off anything that's stuck to rocks. And uh, whisk room is also convenient. We'll cover those tools a little bit more in a few minutes, or maybe in the next video. That's about as good as I can get with my hand. I don't see any gold sticking out here, which is actually not impossible. But nothing there. Okay, scooping this up, and then we'll start panning. So I've got a half a pan full of stuff that's been run through a quarter-inch screen. And this is a good screen for this dry panning because the smaller the particles, the more efficient this is going to work. But you can run it through a quarter inch or a half inch screen. It just works better the finer it is. Now, what you want to do is agitate it like this a lot, like five or ten minutes worth. You really need to get it moving around a lot to make the gold drop to the bottom. Now, ordinarily, I don't salt the pan, but this is one exception because you need to see how the gold is moving in here. So you either need to put some lead shot in here so you can watch how the lead is moving because lead is half as heavy as gold, so where lead goes, gold should go as well. So you can do that, or I like to throw a couple small nuggets in here um, as bait, see if it'll track some more. So in this one, I'm going to put my one piece of buckshot, two small nuggets, and one my fat nugget, and just watch what happens to them. It won't take long for them to disappear. You may be able to see them right there, or they just drop on top, but two shakes are already gone. So I'm going to do this like this, and we're going to agitate it. Around a circle, back and forth like this, back and forth like this. And then we can do to turn this into a liquid without actually having any liquid in it. And the other thing is that for this to work properly, this material needs to be dry. Very dry. The wetter it is, even just a little bit of dampness will make it clump together and keep it from being a true liquid so the gold will not go to the bottom like it's supposed to. Since I have my own nuggets in there, and I don't want to lose them on the off chance I'm going to make a mistake here, I'm going to pan this directly from here into another pan. So, put the pan underneath me. I always travel with two pans because they're just too useful to pan back and forth and do other things that way. Putting the ripples on the downward side, which is the direction you should have been slanting it all along, we're now going to tilt this so that the dirt just comes up to the edge and just starts rolling off the edge. Watch. That stuff that's coming off right now should be the lightest stuff here. Now, it's also helpful if you can bang it as you go, like this, because the banging action gives you a much better vibration and a much snappier movement and helps to make it a liquid even better. And you want to avoid anything that's working as a, as a mass. See, like right here, I can see it's moving back and forth a little bit. So you make sure that's shaken down so it can work through. And then very slowly, that very top edge, right up there on the front, just knock that off. So as you can see, this is a tedious and labor-intensive process. And even when done perfectly, it never works as well or as efficiently as pulling out with water. Because even if you do it absolutely as best you can do it, you're still going to lose some flour gold and some flakes, but you would not lose them with water. You don't lose too much at a time. Patience is the key here. And this is where those deep ripples on some pans really come in handy. 
because the gold is going to be on the bottom of this and it's going to be hitting these ripples and not letting out. And the farther down you get, the more you need to vibrate like this. Some people advocate scraping off the top on these pans. I don't because I don't think it really separates well enough to really trust that you're likely to lose some gold if you do that. Now one way of doing this when you're sampling the desert is to just pan this down to where you get to your heavies, the stuff that's about to show black sand, and get rid of the stuff that you're sure doesn't have any gold in it, like what I've already gotten rid of. And just get a little closer to the bottom than I am right now, and then start using some water to finish it. That's going to give you a much better job in the long run, and means you can do some pretty accurate sample prospecting without actually carrying much water with you. Every so often you should resettle your stuff back to the back lip there, and then very slowly work it out. As you can see, doing this all day would be exhausting, much more so than panning in a regular creek with water. Now it's getting a little bit lighter, it's a lot easier here. So I'm going to move up a little faster since I can do a good bumping action each time I bang it against my hand. Now you can keep this up all the way down to where you have nothing left but gold. Although, if I was going to do that, I would move from this pan with the thicker riffles down to this pan here that has riffles about half size, and then again to this one here that has riffles about a quarter size. Because as you get closer and closer to the bottom, you're going to need smaller and smaller riffles to catch the gold right. But I'm just going to go a little farther here. I can always see my big nugget bouncing around back here. And I'm already starting to see a, a majority of black sand left now. And the process is the same. You just keep going until you have nothing left. The closer you go to the end, the more likely you are to lose things. Just because it's bounced over the edge. I'm going to drop it back like this. And I can already see my lead shot, my two nuggets, and my big piece of gold. And so I know they stayed in there. So if they stayed in there, I know that most of my gold stayed in there, which means I did it right. So now, I'm going to settle it down here. Pour just enough water out of my quart bottle here to cover it. It shouldn't take about half a cup or so just to get it wet all the way through so that it can actually do a true panning process here. And now I'm going to settle it very well using the heel of my hand here to bang against and then just wash it around. I need a little more water than that. But just a little bit of water goes a long way towards making this much more efficient than just straight dry panning. Also, the other reason why you should use water the last step is that it's very hard to see small pieces of gold in the desert without water. Something about the water magnifies the gold, makes it clearer, and without it, it's very hard to see if there's a little chunk of gold in there, unless it's an actual nugget. And so, Doing it without water makes it much harder to know if you're actually finding gold or not, which is the whole point. Go ahead and pick the nuggets out and move them down a little ways. Okay, I don't see any other gold in there than what I put in. So, odds are this is not a very good spot. So, black sand doesn't prove this gold. Let's move to another spot and keep sampling. Now, there's much better ways of sampling, and we'll get to those next. So, just to confirm my point, I wanted to go ahead and pan the same pan of dirt out with water in it, the way you would in a river, just to compare the quality. And this will show you why I like wet panning so much more. First of all, it took me about a quarter of the time, and maybe I'm not the world's best dry panel. Maybe I should have been more patient. Uh, maybe the dirt should have been a little bit more dry. But still, look what I found in this pan that the other dry panning method left behind. So you can see here, 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 and up here, four decent sized specks of gold, and another one down here, so five decent sized specks of gold that I would have lost had I just accepted the dry panning method's results.